It is a privilege and joy that we can continue our study about the least of these. And today we have living the Advent hope. What is the Advent hope? The Advent hope is the hope that the suffering on this earth, the disease, the poorness, death, the strives, the fights, and the destroying of nature will come to an end. It is described in the Bible that the whole nature is suffering under this heavy load of the human action which comes from his mind in which he believes an error about himself, thinking he's a God, thinking he's a supreme being. And this error makes him to violate the law and Violation of the law is injustice, and injustice is the cause of all suffering and misery. So it must be removed. By what can the cause be removed? So let us review and see that when God created Adam and Eve, they were dependent on him, but they separated from him through mistrust because they wanted to be like God. They wanted to be a supreme being. And so, since that is impossible to live separated from God, they die. And they give as an inheritance to every one of their descendants the same lie into their mind, which leads inevitably to also the physical death. So we are all born spiritually dead. It's one life that is multiplied in billions of individuals, but it is one life. And in order that this life can be saved, the Son of God, Christ, must become this life. He must enter, he must become this life, and out of this life create a new life, the second Adam, the eternal life. This God and his Son creates without our participation. None of us was asked if Christ should come or not. None of us was asked about the plan of salvation. God made it to rescue Adam's life. But he did not make it only for Adam. He made it for every individual that is part of this life. So, in this way, he offers this second life, this eternal life, he offers to every individual who has a mind and can decide on this earth. They all are born with the same handicap and by the same action of faith, they can take the life of Jesus and in the moment they take the life of Jesus, they become alive. That's what Jesus explains in John chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that, on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. So this is it. In a moment someone takes the life of Christ. He is in eternal life. We read the same thing in Romans chapter 8. It says here, verse from verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So, I, every individual, can take this life only by faith and become alive. He can take the life of Christ by faith. And become alive. Without faith. It's not possible. So when Christ rescued. The life of Adam. 
He didn't rescue you and me. Some people believe that, though. Some people believe that he rescued all humanity. Well, he, he rescued the human life because it's one. But the individual must be rescued individually. That's why God gave his son, if we read John 3, 16, for the whole world, when he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son unto the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So, if you want to stay like you are born, you need to do nothing. You just stay like you are born. Nothing will change. But if, if the need is to be born again, and that is the chapter in John 3 where jo uh, Jesus speaks to, to Nicodemus, and he says, you must be born again. That is only possible if you believe. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is, he has not the identity of the life of Christ. And this is the condemnation that light is come unto the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest him his deeds should be reproved. But he that doth truth cometh to the light, that is, that his deeds might be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So you see the connection, the only connection that we can have to God is through the life of Jesus. But this life you must take in by faith, understanding that you have an error in your heart and you need a new life. This new life is the only hope of getting free from the cause of suffering. Is the only hope. And this new life is the hope when it is discovered in us for the whole world that at last the advent hope the second advent of Christ can happen so let us understand there are two wellsprings in reality we were born with the lie that I am God and out of this lie nothing good can come out. And out of the truth to be the life of Jesus, to be a creature of God, to be a son of God or a child of God, there can nothing evil come out. The Apostle John, he says, 1 John 3, where he says from verse 9, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever does not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. And as you can read the context and you'll see it's all about having the wrong identity and the new identity. Who is born out of God, that life of Christ, that newly created life of Christ, cannot sin. Because it cannot separate itself from God again. That's not possible. This has been what God accomplished in his son. That the, the evil once happened that Lucifer separated thinking he could become uh, like God. 
separating, taking his trust away from God through this plan of salvation is made impossible. The life that comes from God, this newborn person. So let's see. John says, uh, Romans 1 says this, verse 4, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So when Christ resurrected from the dead, he was a new creature in which none possibility to mistrust God is any more there. Closed forever. That's why everything we do out of Christ can never be sin. That's why John, understanding the principle that out of the right well nothing evil can come, out of the second life of Christ, I mean the, the second Adam, the one resurrected from the dead, there is impossibility of sin. That is impossibility of mistrusting God. So that's why who is born of God, and Christ was born of God, who, who was renewed through the death, he is impossible to sin. This is our life. This must become our life. But this is a, a matter of thoughts. Of course, we know that every action is the result of a thought. But every thought is the reaction of who I believe I am, of my identity. So yes, sometimes people just on their actions see that they are wrong. But we must become, before we act, when in our conscious the thought comes up, we must check it, we must see it, and we must eliminate the error before the action comes out. I mean, not even doing the wrong decision. So that's why the battle is one in the mind. It's one in the heart. But it, we cannot go without the conscious. So I must always check my thoughts and my actions. Where do they come from? They have only two wells. It's either the lie about yourself or the truth about yourself. So when you have thoughts, or I have thoughts of compulsion, thoughts of fear, thoughts of pressure, thoughts of guilt, thoughts of abandonment, loneliness, hopelessness, those are thoughts that cannot come out of the truth. They come out of the lie about myself, and they must be killed. But not the thought in itself, but the the wellspring where it comes from. I must realize in my mind the wellspring. And I must choose when I have the truth to take the truth instead of the lie. This is the battle of faith. I must have thoughts which I can move freely about. Thoughts who don't push me or press me to a decision, but leave the decision in a free way to take it. Now, this is very important to understand that the Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit. And we have read that the Spirit of Christ makes me free from the law of death. And you can read the whole context of Romans 8. I just go to verse 14 for as many as are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry abba father the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of god so, the Spirit of God doesn't command to us things. Like, go do this, go do that. Some people perceive the Spirit of God in His impressions. 
the Spirit of God works on our spirit by changing our identity, making sure who am I? Because that is that what needs to be changed. And that is not the matter of an action. If I do it or not, that's a matter of conviction. So when the Spirit of God cooperates with my spirit and my spirit with his spirit, he wants to bring a conviction to me. And that conviction must become my conviction. It cannot be his. And the conviction is, do this what I think? Is that what I do? Do I do it out of the truth of God? Is it out of my trust in God that I do this action? Or the thought that comes before the action? Or is it out of my old nature? Out of the flesh? And so the Spirit of God helps me and he brings to my spirit convictions of who am I? Because if that is right, if I would know and I'm convinced in the heart of hearts, I mean, they're at the bottom of where I don't know what happens. That's why it's subconscious. If there I am convinced that I am Christ's child, God's child through Christ, then, of course, the results will be seen in our thoughts, which will be pure. And in our actions, would we be the same? So the, the cooperation with the Spirit of God is not about actions. Even though every thought is an action that comes out of the trust that I have either in God or in humans or in the devil. But he works on the conviction who I am because that makes me to trust and to act in this way or the other way. So he brings thoughts of hope to us. Thoughts of hope don't come from the evil. Now he does not bring a hope to us which is not realistic. I mean that hope needs to be based on something that is not movable. And that is the law that is the word of God as the Bible says it. So I need to understand when I have thoughts that are unrealistic, like I have people who, and, and patients who say, well, I can influence through my mind the moon, and that's why the earthquake in Japan, Japan happened. Or another lady told me that she um, is responsible because of the flight uh, or whatever from Malaysia went into uh was disappeared because of her. So those are ideas that are unrealistic. Now, not all have that extreme ideas, but worry is the same source. If you have worry, you have the same source of irrealistic thinking. And out of irrealistic thinking comes the irrealistic act to want something that you cannot. So I must be clear, I must be convinced according to the effects out of where does come my actions. So John says it very clear. We know the difference between the child of God and the child of man by what they do. He who is just or he who does justice is just. He who loves his brother is doing it out of Christ. He who does not love his brother does it out of the sinful nature, out of that wrong identity. So there is a battle about conviction and we must fight it. Yes, it just a mental issue. And we have 
to win it. And through Christ, we can win it. This is the good news. This is the hope. We only have a choice to change something when we know the truth. When we are convinced from where do the thought arise. So looking as an overview of the plan of salvation, it's 6,000 years that took from the Adam separation from God over the flood, then Abraham, then the exodus from Egypt, then the first coming of Christ, his death on the cross, the 12 apostles who were called the church to be the light of the world, to show him love and mercy, and then the end time in which God has to reveal the sons of God, and then comes the second coming of Christ, and comes the millennium, and then the third coming of Christ with the judgment. Now, we speak about the Advent hope. There are three Advent hopes because there are three comings of Christ. Now, the first Advent hope the people had until Christ came. But this hope was disappointed because they didn't understand the cause of the problem. When Jesus came, those who waited on him had a wrong expectation of his coming and might it be today the same i am convinced today we have a wrong expectation of the coming of christ but nevertheless his plan is for sure it all goes after he has planned it so god needed four thousand years for the universe to lose its confidence in lucifer God didn't give Lucifer a border in that way. He could not tempt those around him. They all could see the universe is a free place where everyone can see what happens on earth. And by that, what happened here on earth for 4,000 years, and that he crucified the Son of God. He couldn't kill him. That's not possible. But he's responsible for putting him on the cross. He loses his confidence for the universe. So God doesn't need to make a barrier to prohibit anyone anything. He just proves through his son, through the four time, for the 4,000 years, what thus it do when someone separates from God and believes he has a better idea, he has a better solution, he has a better way to live. So that is, was a great hope for the universe first coming of Christ but it is the hope of our time because until the second coming of Christ God has a plan that the righteous people should lose their confidence completely in Lucifer so with the 144,000 he must realize that which is the hope that is described here in chapter 8 in Romans from 17. And if children, then heirs. So if we are children, we are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, for the earnest expectation of creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For what do they wait? Let's read further. For the creature was made subject to vanity. I mean the whole world because it was dependent on Adam. Not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope because the creature itself that's all 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 world also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of god for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now and not only they 
but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown with it ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that he is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patient wait for it. So, what's the hope? What's the glorious Advent hope? It is the revelation of the sons of God. And Paul describes them here in Romans 8 until the end. It's those who are inseparable from God. They are those that he says, who shall separate, in verse 35, us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or anything else? Will anything be possible to separate us from Christ? No. That means we are free. So who are the sons of God? There are none else than the 144,000. Those who have written on their foreheads the name of the Father and the Son. They are the sons of God that must be revealed in order that the hope of the earth shall be fulfilled. Without their revelation, the second advent hope is only an illusion. It will never happen. If not a first, the sons of God are free. And they are those that have, they are the first fruits. They are those who must be sealed against death like those at the exodus before the exodus from Egypt which is the parallel, the picture of what is going to happen in our time. So the glorious Advent hope is the liberation of our hearts. In order then the liberation of nature and of our bodies should take place at His coming. It must come to be revealed, and God put the time, put the, the number, He fixed the number of 144,000 that must be totally free from all trusting the devil anymore. Free, living out of Christ replaced completely the old nature with the new. That's then fulfilling. Then we will see the difference, Malachi says, between the sons of God and the not sons of God. Then we will see the difference, like John says, between those who are the sons of God who are not the sons of God. Because it will be made visible in action, what took place in a long battle in the heart. And then comes Christ, and then when the great and the last judgment takes place after the millennium, all people loses their trust in Lucifer. You know why? Because when the devil then, after revelation of the judgment, wants to say, let's go against it, we still can win, to go against the city of God. None of him, none of them believe him. The devil's power is crashed without violence. God brings him to the end and none will believe him anymore. He must, when he executes judgment to destroy the devil, the, the root and the branches, he makes to everyone a favor. Because they are un, it's not possible for them to live, however. They would come to an end. And so he brings them to an end because he must execute judgment as the only one who can do it. Now there is a hope of the resurrection of the dead, the just and the unjust. We will read in John 
5, we have seen there that Christ says from verse 25, Very, very, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father has life in himself, so has the, he given to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in that which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So resurrection of the dead is something that only in Christianity exists or I would say in that which is the truth. Because there are only two options. Either the soul lives eternally, like all religions believe that we are gods and so we must be eternal, cannot die, a god cannot die, that's true. And, or, we are creatures that can die for a time and for eternity. Now, there is no possibility to bring both together, resurrection and immortal of the soul. If people go to heaven right away when they are dying, if they are good guys, if they have the life of Christ, then the whole resurrection is nonsense. At least for the righteous. There should be no righteous resurrection. Maybe only the one that passed away, but now for them they found hell as uh, the place of living, so they are not dead, but they are suffering in hell, which is also an, an irrealistic and absolute wrong idea that someone should suffer for, for a very long time for doing a little bit. So the resurrection is a thing of the Bible, and it says that the wicked dead people and the righteous dead people are in the same place. I put them just separately, but they are in the same place. And the first one who was resurrected was Moses. He resurrected in a glorified body of Christ, in the body of the second Adam. There were other resurrections in the Bible that was not glorified. The son of the widow of Zarephtha, the son of the widow of Elisha, the man who was thrown in Elijah's grave, the young man of nine, the daughter of Jairus, Lazarus, Tabitha, Eutychus. All this died again, and they could be among the righteous or among the wicked. We don't know. Christ resurrected, glorified in that Sunday morning, and together with him, the first fruits, those graves that were opened through the earthquake in the evening of his resurrection, of his uh, death on the cross, and those graves that were opened when Jesus came out of the grave, they came out of the grave also glorified. They were people that were living because they were known, they were recognized by the others, the Bible explains. So they must have been living together with them. They died and now they come out glorified, never to die again, never to have any, any temptation. Those are the first fruits. Then in the end time, there will be a special resurrection of the just and of the unjust, of the godless. And then at second coming of Christ, all that will hear his voice will come out and will come out glorified without any possibility. They have the body of Christ. And those who are alive, the 144,000, are translated into that body. And then at the third coming of Christ, there will be the resurrection of all the people from Cain for the final judgment. They resurrect just to see the judgment and then become the final judgment. Then God can clear the universe and recreate all of it. And we read in Revelation 21 verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And verse 27, 
and there shall in no wise enter into it, that is, in the city of God, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So, living the Advent hope is what? It is by sanctifying our lives so that the hope of nature will be freed as well when the sons of God are freed. So, do you live the Advent hope or you live an illusion? Do you know that you must contribute for the second coming of Christ in order that that should happen? Do you know that you are put in a responsibility there? I hope you know. And I hope you are willing to cooperate so that the hope of nature and the hope of our bodies to be translated will not remain a hope, but will be a reality very soon. I, for myself, want to cooperate for this purpose because I want to live the Advent hope. What about you? Amen.